If you have your Bible, you can open it um, or you could pull out your phone and we can jump right into 1 Timothy chapter 1 and um, we will do 1 Timothy chapter 1. Is that is that good? Is that everybody can curse? First Timothy chapter one. It says First Timothy behind me, so. Okay. So I think we're Thessalonians? We finished. No. Yeah, we did Second Thessalonians chapter three. Because I have it all written up. And, yeah, so. 2 Thessalonians 3, August 31st. There you go. And then we canceled September 7th. So we are in... 1 Timothy chapter okay. 1. Got it. There you go. Uh, everybody's just laughing at us now <laughs> behind the scenes. But it's all good. We're, uh, we're, we're just happy that you're with us. And we're happy, that, um, we're happy that you're ready to study the Word with us. How's that? So um, the good news is, is that 1 Timothy chapter 1 is... 20 verses long so you and us are going to be able to like handle this chapter pretty quick um, so just hold on it might be a wild ride here so all right we are ready to roll you ready to roll yes she's ready okay all right first timothy chapter one we all agree we all agree <laughs> paul an apostle of christ jesus according to the commandment of god our savior and our Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain, remain on at Ephesus, Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doc, doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God by, uh, by of God which is by faith but the goal of our instruction is love and pure heart oh is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith amen amen so we've got um we've got this uh it's not a very long letter, First Timothy. It's not. It's it's just pretty. It's pretty small. If you ever want to just tackle a whole book of the Bible, I say, yeah, just just read First Timothy. You can you can do that in one sitting. So it's not too bad. And we know it was Paul wrote it, and we know who he wrote it to. To Timothy, mm -hmm. he wrote it to Timothy, and so it says that um, it was written in about A.D. sixty-five, and so you know we know that was probably. Um, maybe 30 or so years after Christ's death and resurrection. And so there's a little time underneath, a um, little time that they've been spreading the gospel. And it says that um, Paul sent Timothy to lead the, uh, the Ephesus church while he moved on to Macedonia. And from there, Paul wrote this letter of encouragement and instruction mm -hmm. to help Timothy deal with the difficult situation in the church in Ephesus or in the Ephesian church and um, and so this is great like you know at any time that that you're a, a leader and and you're doing hard things it's great that you can have because Paul was definitely like his mentor his you know his role model his spiritual dad he calls him my my child in the faith mm -hmm. and uh, so it's great that um, that he could get this letter from Paul to really kind of illuminate the direction that he needed to take this church in, it's uh, just a great reminder that you know we don't we don't do this on our own in church. Like we, you know, we're able to get help from other people, and what a blessing that is because there's lots of people who are smarter than we are, or who are you know further along in the faith than we are, and we can, as the Bible says, right? Godly counsel is very important. So, so really cool. Um, and then he says, again, he was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, um, but watch out, right, this strange doctrines, myths, mm -hmm. genealogies, you know, um, and I think we still, we still have that stuff today. We do. Yeah, so, you know, you've just got to be super careful that you adhere to the Bible, that you find... Um, that, that you find your direction and you find your instruction 
in the Word of God. And they didn't really they didn't really have the New Testament though at that point. So um, so they were going by faith. That's for sure. Going by faith. So I don't. You see. Let's see. You went down to the end of seven. Uh, no, five. I think. Oh, the end of five. Okay. Yeah. There we go. But that's great, though. I love verse five. It says the goal of our instruction is love, mm -hmm. from pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And um, and I know that instruction. Um, I was talking to somebody this week, and we were talking about how hard it is to take instruction and how hard it is to mm -hmm. take criticism even um, when we know that it's the truth because it's it it's just hard it's hard to take that stuff so it's a lot easier if it comes in love um, sometimes it doesn't make it easier to hear but it uh, but when we have to hear it it is nice that we can um, we can take it on from people um, who do love us and maybe we'll give it to us in a and not so harsh of a package um, <laughs> that you know that that causes us problems. So anyway, that's that's all I have to say about yeah. instruction. No, I think this is a good verse too for new believers to to take in and like remember it, or mm -hmm. even for us who have been um, in faith for a while now, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of atheists or um, yeah, I want to say atheists. They, they say, well, your God is a God of wrath. Your God is not of love or anything. He doesn't love like gay people or this type of person or this or that. Um, but he is. He, and well, he's not a God of wrath, but he is a God of love. Um, a lot of the things that happen in the Bible were because they didn't follow God's instruction. And of course, there was, um, it's like a parent. A parent disciplines their child to correct them. And that's exactly what happened. God said, if you don't change your ways, this is what's going to happen. You know, so yeah. I think, again, um, he came to, he comes to us with love and says, this is, this is the path you're going on, you know, path of destruction. So let's go veer you back onto the uh, straight yeah, and narrow. Yeah, get back, get a, mm -hmm. it's so It's so wonderful, too, that God is like, God is the same yesterday today and tomorrow and mm -hmm. and I know that as a culture we we're pretty um, we're pretty active right now in changing what the Bible says we're active mm -hmm. in changing what theology is um, and we're you know we're like oh no you know this God accepts this and God accepts this but God is always the same and he's like mm, nope it's all in here right. this is what it is these are this is how I need you to live if you want to get to heaven here's what you do and it's like, oh, all right, we, we overcomplicate things, don't we? We, we certainly do. Mm -hmm. Can you read all those? Do you have your glasses on? No. Oh, oh. John says, good evening, ladies. And Karen says, Timothy was told to set the people straight on the future message. Yes, we do have to speak up. And she says, we have to be, we have to continue in the, uh, in, in the study of the Bible so we do not know so we do know the true message. Amen. So we're not uh, so we're not pulled aside by mm -hmm. all the things it says in three strange doctrines and in four myths and endless genealogies and speculation and and all of this stuff. It's like nope. It's just it's it's not it's not real hard, isn't it? Funny. Like it's not actually as hard as we make it to be. The word of God, how God wants us to live, it's not that complicated. He's already laid it all out. So, um, so all these people who come and like they like to add stuff in, um, yeah, Timothy was gonna have to, you know, maybe put the hammer down mm -hmm. in love, but say, yep, no, that's not that's not how we're that's not how we're rolling around here. Sorry, mm -hmm. Church of Ephesus. So. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, John, and thanks, Karen, for adding that in. You're very helpful. Yeah. Uh, so verse 6? Sure. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the, matter, or the matters about which they make confident um, assertion. Assert, yeah, assertions. Mm -hmm. But we know that the law that the law is good, 
if one uses it lawfully, uh, realizing that realizing the fact that the, that law is not made for a righteous person. But for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers, and immoral men, or, and immoral men, and homosexuals, and kidnappers, and liars, and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, uh, with which I have been entrusted, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he has considered uh, me faithful. He has considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly blas uh, a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, so he's talking about the law, and he said the law is good if you use it lawfully. That's kind of interesting. Realizing that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for those who are lawless mm -hmm. and rebellious. So, um, you know, which is, is somewhat, you know, it's like I know um, as a as a Christian that I am not to murder um, that I am you know not to steal I'm not to do these things and and so the law doesn't necessarily need to hold me back from those things the law needs to there needs to be consequences to the people who are who are lawless who don't care about anyone else they need to have consequences right um, and so it it talks a little bit about you know trying to um, it says it's for the unholy and for the profane, for people who are who are bad people. Obviously, it makes a whole list of them in nine and ten, in in verse nine and ten. So, um, so anyway, but that's so that's some interesting stuff. But it does it talks about scooting back to seven. It says that the false teachers they wanted to be famous as teachers of of the law, right? Because, but they didn't even understand the law's purpose. And it's in the commentary. It says the law was meant to give believers a list of commands for every occasion, but to show unbelievers their sin and bring them to God. Um, and so that's pretty. That's pretty powerful. That's what. Um, that's what all of these commandments and everything can can help us see. It can help unbelievers see even their sin. So. That's pretty good. Um, and of course, in verse 10, it calls out, um, it calls out uh, homosexual behavior. And so this is what the Bible says. This is, you know, this is not, this is not political. This is not um, us picking on people. This is what the Bible says. It just says, um, it, it says that they are immoral and it lumps them in with murderers, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, um, and so they get lumped in with all of those things. And that's, you know, it, it, I know that a lot of our culture now believes that we can choose our, our sexual preference and we have to be very careful because that's not what the Bible says. That might be what the news says, that might be what your neighbor says or your, you know, or your family members say, but that's not what the Bible says. And so the the act of is is against um, is against God's commands. People, we don't hate people, but um, but we do not you know we do not endorse the the behavior. However, we also don't endorse the behavior of heterosexual people, right? So it's not we're not just picking. That's what homosexuals will often say. They'll say that we're picking on them. Mm -hmm. Uh, for same-sex behavior, but we don't pick on heterosexuals who also, in, you know, engage in behavior that is that is not godly. And they're absolutely right. We need to we need to set that straight that all of these things are ungodly, and all of these things are God against God's commandments, and they are against um, they are contrary to sound teaching, as it says in verse ten. Contrary to sound teaching, so. 
these are these things are put in the Bible so that people can see their sin, so that they can realize their sin, and they can say, wow, I really want to live a life according to, to how God wants me to live, so let me change, let me do something different. And that's um, that's been very, very, uh, it's hard, I get it, it's hard because we each have sin, and we each have a cross to bear. Um, but we also can't give up um, trying to, to live a godly life. That's for sure. Um, I don't know, what do you think about uh, 12 and 13? Paul's pretty hard on himself in 13. Yeah. <laughs> but he's also using himself as an example. Like, I was also there. You know, so. Yeah, and I think that's, that's super powerful because mm -hmm. we all, you know, we all have problems with sin. We all have, you know, we've, we've all had a past and we've all, you know, so we can, we can feel so guilt ridden about our past or about the things that we've done that, you know, it, it kind of puts a barrier up and we're like, oh, God could never accept me. And, um, and so I, you know, it's, it's not even a possibility, and so then they literally don't even try, <laughs> and that's a and that's. But we know Paul's past, and we know that Paul was a murderer of Christians. So it's like, all right. So if you haven't murdered any Christians, then you're you're probably not as bad as Paul. So you're doing fine, and um, mm -hmm. and so we just need to hold on tight. Um, just need to hold on tight to. To Jesus because no matter how shameful um, your past God can redeem you and God mm -hmm. can can use you for the kingdom yeah Karen says mercy and grace are greater than all of our sin absolutely absolutely so it uh, and it, it really does help us to you know to 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 step in line with with Jesus Christ his great mercy and his great love um, you know that really gives us those those buffers where we can say, wow, there, there's nothing in my past that's too bad for God. And so it's a blessing. Um, hold on one second. Oh, hey, there you go. There we go. Hey, hi, Rich. Rich is commenting on Facebook, and I just did not rule the thing. I didn't rule the comments up. So my way or the highway, he said eight minutes ago. So. And good to see you both. Good to see you too, sir. Sorry, he said good to see you both. Um, yeah. My way or the highway, I think he's talking about Jesus. Probably. I think you're talking about the Lord. So, which is great. It is. It's his way or um, or no way. He's the only way. <laughs> John 14, 6, right? He's the only way. All right. Um, let's see. And he went down to 14. Mm -hmm. and the yeah. grace of our Lord was more than abundant like Karen was saying too mm -hmm. um, with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus yeah that is um, that is again the the this beautiful like bed of roses that we kind of have even though we're you know we're living this life and mm -hmm. and it's really tough sometimes to to you know to stay you know, step for step in the will of God. And, and we get that because we've all been there. But, you know, his love, his faith, his, his mercy, his grace um, helps us to have greater faith. And so that's, that's what make, makes things easier is when we truly believe that he's got our back, when we truly believe that he can heal, when we truly believe mm -hmm. that he can um, redeem our lives, you know, we can... It's just it's there's just so much more than um, to to our relationship with Jesus, so much more. All right, and then um, and then in fifteen, did you read fifteen? No, not yet. Okay, and then we go right. ahead to fifteen. It is fifteen. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into um, came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as uh, the foremost, wait, yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, 
Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now the king now to the king eternal, immortal, invinc- invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the uh, prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to, uh, not to blaspheme. Yikes. Yeah. That's not sound good. But, uh, but back up in um, 15. In 15, yeah, thank you, where we started. That's kind of, Paul kind of summarizes the good news. He kind of summarizes the, the gospel right there that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and no sinner is beyond Jesus' saving power, right? And in the commentary, it talks about Jesus didn't come to show us how, merely to show us how to live a better life or to challenge us to be better people. He came to offer us salvation that leads to eternal life. And, um, and we need to make sure that that is at the, the, fore, the forefront of our purpose and we need to help people to see um, that, you know, that Jesus is offering salvation for all of us. And no matter how, no matter how bad, um, no matter how bad we are or how, you know, how far off the path we are, um, Jesus came to offer us the gift of salvation. So um, I don't know. can I read what Karen wrote? Karen says, talk about being called out, Hymenaeus and Alexander. He called them out. He says he handed them over to Satan Mm -hmm. so they would be taught not not to blaspheme. (laughs) Like, okay, they they must have been somebody important in the church who who must have had a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, it's um, a lot, they must have had some influence, I guess. It, so, because otherwise they probably wouldn't have been called out so specifically, and uh, I, oh, never, never want, never want to be handed over to Satan. Never, nope. never want to be handed over to Satan. That's that's ridiculous. That's that's the worst. Yeah. On my commentary, it says that um, Hymenaeus' error is explained in Second Timothy. Mm -hmm. Uh, chapter 2 verse 17 through 18 it says he weakened people's faith by teaching that the resurrection had already occurred paul says that um, he handed himenaeus over to satan meaning that paul had removed removed him from the fellowship of the church Mm -hmm. that's it so that's um yeah so that's what i was thinking that like he must be he must have had some kind of authority in the church and then he was must have been teaching something so that was not um, appropriate mm-hmm. so yeah that's exactly it if he was um, if he was I don't know it says that the resurrection had already occurred maybe he means the resurrection of the dead like in the second coming I'm not entirely sure because the resurrection has had occurred Jesus's death and resurrection so mm-hmm. not exactly sure what that means but if you have anything in your commentaries um, definitely put it in your comments here so we can um, we can see what your Bible say. So I I do like in eighteen um, he was talking about um, Timothy that in accordance to the prophecies previously made concerning you, and um, and that's that's really sweet that um, you know that Timothy had already been like set apart from ministry and and so he was just talking about you know that he's. He is literally going to um, to rise up and and be this person that they prophesied mm-hmm. him to be, and so a great leader and um, and a man of of great faith, right? So, um, and then it talks about in nineteen. I think it it it's probably in your commentary too. We have the same commentaries tonight. It talks about keeping a good conscience, and uh, because obviously we know that our 
you know, people talk about their conscience and, and all of that, but if you're not a believer who's walking with the Lord, your conscience can be changed. Like your conscience, you can't trust your conscience because your conscience comes from, you know, somewhere possibly where you're creating these things, where you're justifying your behavior. You know, I, I love to say things and go, oh, well, you know, well, they were, they were wrong. So that's why I had to say that, you know, or I had to correct them or I had to set things straight or I had to do this or I had to do that, you know, literally kind of like just justifying my behavior mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not always good. So again, like my conscience is not necessarily, um, is might not, might not be in the best place right there, but it says that if you treasure your faith in Christ more than anything else, and do what you know is right, each time you deliberately ignore your conscience, you are hardening your heart. Over a period of time, your capacity to tell right from wrong will diminish. And that's kind of what I was talking about. Our conscience mm -hmm. may be aligned with God, but it may not be. And so you have to be very careful when we talk about listening to your conscience. You just need to listen to the word of God. It says, as you walk with God, he will speak to you through your conscience, letting you know the difference between right and wrong. Be sure to act on those inner tugs that you do what is right. Then your conscience will remain clear. Your conscience needs to be aligned with Jesus Christ. And that's, um, if you feel like it is getting, getting a little off balance or you're not listening to it, then, you know, that's, it's dangerous. I'll just say that. When in doubt, read the Bible. When in doubt, listen to the word of God because that will not steer you wrong. So let's see. I think I don't think there's anything new there that Karen said. Sorry, Karen, I couldn't see if something new had popped up. Um let's see, I don't know, you got any you got anything else? Uh no. That's it. There we go. So, you know. Um I think in 16, I, I skipped over 16, it just said, um, for this reason, um, for this reason, Paul found mercy, and he's talking about how bad he used to be, and he said, I found mercy, um, so that, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life, so, um, so it's just another, just another encouragement to us that, you know, that Jesus is waiting for us. Jesus has mercy for us. There is no sinner. There is no one that can't be saved. Um, even though, you know, we sometimes go, oh, wow, that person's beyond help. Um, Jesus doesn't say that. And so I like how Paul was kind of like, I was beyond help. He, you know, he was a murderer of Christians. He was the worst of the worst. And he um, he was saved and obviously turned his whole life around, became mm -hmm. an apostle, and so um, so that's pretty that's pretty powerful. That's pretty amazing, and um, and we have always a lot to learn about Paul. Yeah, I've come across a couple of um, uh, who are now um, born again Christians. They when I first talked to them, they were saying. In, in separate times, um, they didn't know each other. They still don't know each other. But anyway, um, each one of them said, "But I'm too, I, I'm not good enough, or I yeah. whatever I've done." They didn't tell me their sins or anything or what they committed. They said, "I cannot be forgiven for the, for my crimes or my my sins. Like God does right. not love me, you know." And right. And I'm like, that that there is the enemy. That there's uh, he's a liar, and he will try to keep you there for as long as he can, so that mm -hmm. you do not change your life and give your life to Christ. Um, if you're in that position now, read the Bible. I mean, Paul here is saying, you know, that he was a murderer and um, he did other, you know, crimes. And then there was um, Moses who also killed a man, right? Mm -hmm. And there was King David who committed sins and along with other women of the Bible, right, who have um, committed sins and turned their um, lives um, over to Jesus. And they were they were all saved, and look how they were used in the Bible. And I remember hearing Pastor Paul during um, one of our Bible studies, and he said, if Jude, uh, Judas would have waited just a little bit longer, imagine what that book 
would have been like, that mm-hmm. book of forgiveness. Um, I, I believe that Jesus Christ would have gone over to him and said, hey, that prophecy was fulfilled, you yeah. know? And he probably, we would have probably been forgiven, you know? So, but now we... Absolutely. We I mean, it's, yeah. we'll never know, but it, it was a total possibility yeah. because no one is beyond being mm-hmm. forgiven. No one is beyond, you know, being being saved. Right. And that's... That gives hope to mm-hmm. to those of the to those of us who have felt like in that situation where we're like, there's just no way, I've I've done too much, I've gone too far, I've you know, yeah. I'm just not good enough. Yeah. Even now, as as a Christian, I sometimes fall back into that. Absolutely, know? absolutely. Because um, the enemy mm-hmm. likes to sneak in, right, and plant plant seeds in our mind and and make us. Um, it, like erode our self confidence, um, who we are in Jesus Christ, and and it's a you know it's that same sort of thing. It's like you can't allow that to to go too far because you you will start believing believing those lies, and and it happens you know mm-hmm. when we turn our back on Jesus or you know when we stop reading the Word, we stop praying, we stop fellowshipping. It's real easy for the enemy to sneak in. And say, oh, you know, I, you know, it, I, that always happens in my life. Like, you know, I, I skip reading the Bible for a couple of days, you know, and it's like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. You're fine. You don't really, you know, mm-hmm. you can skip another day. And but I don't, and you don't always see it right away. But like, there's things that erode in your life, and peace, definitely supernatural mm-hmm. peace, goes right out the window, and you don't usually notice it right away. And then you're like, oh, wow. Wow, things have been really hard lately. <laughs> like, yes, that's right. They have been really hard. You've, you know, you can't for, you can't forsake your first love, and you can't you can't keep a relationship going if you don't if you don't work on it, right? Are you saved? Yes, you're saved. But you need to stay. You need to stay in the Word. You need to stay fed. You need to stay all of those things because we believe that you can lose your salvation. Um, you can walk away from God, and um, and if you stay in the Word, you stay in fellowship, you stay in prayer. I think that would be almost impossible to walk away from God with you know with that kind mm-hmm. of lifestyle and with that kind of um, structure in your life. I know that I know it's really boring sometimes to talk about you know how how we need to have structure and how we need to do these things and. Because, you know, we just want to skip them. We want to do them when we want to do them. Um, but, you know, that there's an important reason that it says pray without ceasing. You know, it's important that, you know, that worship, we make worship a part of our everyday life. And it's important that we are in the Word. So, so good for us. We've all been in the Word tonight. That's right. Karen says, we can only develop a conscience turned into Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is... Uh, through the study of the Bible and a, and a lot of prayer, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Amen, amen. Very good. On that note, Karen, we're going to wrap up. We gave you the, the, last, the last word there, very appropriate. So, so thank you.